Well, thank you very much for inviting me, and I was really pleased to be giving the Kapuscinski uh, lecture. He was a towering figure. Um, I think for me, especially in those tumultuous times at the end of the 80s and the beginning of the 90s, when communism was collapsing and the Cold War was ending, but they were times that were full of optimism and hope. And I think we're now living through another period of tumultuous time, which unfortunately is a period of pessimism and fear. And that's really what I want to talk about. I mean, for someone of my generation, it's unthinkable that phenomena that I never thought I would see in my lifetime, such as, um, especially in the Middle East and Africa, but everywhere, such as refugees drowning in the Mediterranean, uh, such as the bombing, deliberate bombing of hospitals and schools, long distance assassination on a massive scale, killing people with lorries and aircraft, using hideous weapons that are prohibited by international law like chemical weapons, incendiaries, cluster munitions, beheading, torture, the reintroduction of sexual slavery. These were all just unthinkable only a few years ago. And how do we make sense of it? Um, I think it's particularly important for us here as Europeans because we're surrounded by powers that are actually contributing to these tragedies. Um, we're seeing the rise of xenophobia and racism and right-wing populism in the US, Russia, China, India, and also on our own continent. Uh, but nevertheless, even though we're seeing it inside the European Union, the European Union, as, as, as Werner just told us, does still represent a beacon of human rights and democracy. And I suppose the question that we're all grappling with, how can we sustain these values and what can we do to reverse these terrifying tendencies? And I want to... What I'm going to do in this lecture is to introduce the concept of security cultures as a way of <coughs> helping us make sense of what's happening. And um, I will make the argument that the kind of security culture that the European Union develops uh, will profoundly shape and be shaped by the kind of institution that the European Union becomes or doesn't become in the future. So I'll start with talking about what I mean by security cultures and then I will talk about the European common security and defense policy. So by security culture, I mean a way of doing security, a sort of combination of narratives, tools, practices, infrastructure, which embed certain styles of doing security. Um, I think in the Cold War period, we were dominant. There was only one way, at least internationally, of doing security, and that was geopolitics. Basically, external security policy consisted of the possession of regular armed forces designed to fight other states. Um, internal security, of course, varied from repression to um, rights-based policing and there was at least in our imaginations a sharp distinction between what was internal security and what was external security. To some extent UN peacekeeping represented an alternative outside security culture, the liberal peace, but at, during the Cold War it was very insignificant. I think what's interesting now, and it represents the sort of turbulent transitional period that we're living through, is that we are seeing competing security cultures that actually blur the difference between inside and outside, and that's what I want to explain. So why did I develop this concept? Well, the starting point was the notion of what I call the security gap, a very simple, 
question that turned out to be much more complicated to answer than I realized. And the simple question is, why is it that millions of people in the world live in conditions of deep insecurity, and yet our security services that mostly consist of regular armed forces, not only don't address the problems they face, but in many cases make them worse. So that was my sort of, if you like, my research question. And I very quickly realized I was looking at apples and pears. And the problem with the word security is that it's a very ambiguous word. <laughs> On the one hand, it means safety. Uh, that's the objective. But usually when we talk about security in everyday language, we're talking about security practices. We're talking about uh, airport scanners. We're talking about locks. We're talking about the military, the intelligence. And the problem is that these two don't, often don't fit together. You, what I found really fascinating thinking about this is that this difference in understanding of security is actually reflected in the academic literature. So on the one hand, there's a strand of literature that is concerned with the objectives of security, and that's the whole discussion about human security, about you know, do we do national, human, planetary security, and security from what? Is it from climate change? Is it from war? Is it from poverty? That's one set of literature. And then there's another set of literature that deals with security practices. And for example, very important strand of that literature is the literature on securitization. The idea that when you perform security, you're saying something about political power. In the Cold War, when we observed military exercises on the East German plain, it was a way of telling us that the worst threat to our security that could possibly happen would be another war, and we should be grateful to our governments who were preparing and to protect us from another war. And it was an idea that did, in a sense, keep us safe. It gave us a sense of security. And I think there's a problem with both of these schools of thought, because the people who talk about objectives assume somehow that the state or international institutions are a deus ex machina. If you can only just persuade them to adopt human security, for example, they will then magically find the institutions and the tools in which to achieve human security. But the problem with the other sort of way of thinking, the securitization way of thinking, is that while it draws our attention to the deep-rooted power relations that underpin security, it doesn't tell us how to deal with the real security problems that we face today, whether it's wars in places like Syria and Yemen, organized crime or terrorism. So, you know, so how do we solve that dilemma? And, and, and really, I developed the notion of a security culture as a way to bring together objectives and practices. So the reason that regular armed forces aren't much use when people are feeling insecure is that they're not designed to make individuals more secure. They're designed to face a fight against other states. And the problem is that ways of doing security are so deeply embedded that it's extremely difficult to adapt security cultures. So just to tell you a little bit more about this concept and then to say something about different types. Uh, I, I was very influenced by the term in the strategic studies literature, which is strategic culture. And the term strategic culture was developed in the 1950s by strategists at the Rand Corporation. These were people who were imagining a nuclear war and were drawing up elaborate plans of what, Russia, what the Soviet Union will do if we do this and what we will do as though it were a chess game. And what they couldn't understand was why did the Soviet Union not behave the way they predicted? 
So they invented the concept of strategic culture to explain why different, uh, different countries or different powers do security differently. Um, and nowadays, there is quite a lot of literature about whether the EU has a common strategic culture. So my concept of security culture differs from this notion in three ways. First of all, I'm, the strategic culture was very much about how you do military. It was about military culture. And security may not be about military nowadays. You know, whether you're talking about internal security, which is about policing or uh, development security, it, it, you know, security doesn't have to be about the military. So that's the first difference. The second difference is that it's functional rather than ethnic or territorial. In other words, it's about a way of doing security rather than about the British or the um, Soviet way of doing security. And um, so, for example, uh, people in the Pentagon and people in the Russian Ministry of Defense who both espouse a geopolitical model of security have much more in common with each other than they do with the peacekeepers or the humanitarians who people what I call the liberal peace security culture. So it's functional, it's a sort of social idea of culture. And the third big difference is that it's not an essentialist view of culture, it's a constructed view of culture. So the strategic culture theorists tended to be essentialist. You know, they would say, well, Britain has naval power because Britain's always had naval power. <laughs> um, you know, Britain's a maritime power, and so they've always chosen to emphasize their navy. And um, in exactly the same way, when you talk about ethnic culture, there are those essentialists who say, I don't know, in the Balkans, it's ancient rivalries or whatever. It's deeply embedded in culture. In fact, the key point about this notion of culture is that it's constructed and it has to reproduce itself and it reproduces itself through budgets, through political debates, through actual contingencies. And what's useful about thinking in that way is that you can identify pathways and in those pathways you might find openings, divergences, experiments that offer you alternative routes. So I think that's a very important aspect of the culture notion. So what I do in the book, which I'm not gonna do now because it would take far too long, is to try to provide genealogies of different security cultures, how they evolved, how they developed, how they're changing, because the idea is that security cultures are constantly in flux. So what I do in the book is that I define four broad types of security cultures. They're not exclusive and one could think of others, but they're broadly descriptive of the current security landscape. And I think what's absolutely key is this insight from the securitization scholars that different security cultures are embedded in different sets of power relations. Each of my security cultures are linked to a different type of political authority. Um, and also, what they imply for this inside-outside distinction. So what am I for? Well, the first one I've already talked about is geopolitics. Geopolitics is when the objective is national security, when the means are regular military forces um, and aimed at defending borders or trade routes or whatever. And geopolitics is linked to the emergence and the development of the nation state and to blocks of nation states. And um, it is still the case that geopolitics is the dominant security culture today. 
Most defence budgets are focused on geopolitics. Most narratives, if you, any of you study international relations, that's always going to be about the Soviet Union versus China. There's a geopolitical discourse that dominates the way we think about these issues. Um, and that's, and in theory, geopolitics is very much an outside uh, kind of security policy, although that's not how it works in practice. But for reasons of time, I'm not going to go, go there. So that's the first one. The second one is what I call new wars. Um, and it's odd to call that a security culture, I know, but actually calling understanding contemporary wars as a culture <laughs> rather than a geopolitical contest is actually rather helpful. Um, so new wars, the objectives are capturing state power and resources and the means are networks of state and non-state actors bits of regular forces, militias, warlords, criminal gangs, and the like. And um, we tend to think of war as a deep-seated political contest um, between sides, between states, in the case of a geopolitical war, or between a regime and re rebel, as in the case of a civil war. But actually, if we look at contemporary bouts of violence in places like Syria, Yemen, the DRC, what we observe is numerous armed groups, a sort of social condition, numerous armed groups who gain not from winning or losing, but from violence itself. They either gain politically because they espouse extremist ideologies that are based on fear, and exclusion, or they gain economically because they finance themselves through loot and pillage and through crime, which is um, possible, smuggling, which is possible in these conditions of disorder. And they're a culture because they learn from each other, they're connected to each other, they develop technologies and so on. So I think it's actually quite useful to think about new wars as a culture. And of course, this is both an inside and an outside culture. It's both global and local. The third security culture is the liberal peace, which I already mentioned. And um, it's associated basically with intergovernmental institutions. And it emerged originally as an alternative to geopolitics. Numerous philosophers came up with international peace schemes and they envisaged peace, not as domestic peace, but as peace between nations. <laughs> what we have domestically could vary, uh, but what was key was peace between nations. What we saw after the end of the Cold War was a dramatic growth in the liberal peace, which was seen as a way of addressing the new wars. And we saw a huge growth in UN peacekeeping, in multilateral agencies, in NGOs, the whole kind of complex of things that make up the culture of the liberal peace. So the liberal peace goal is stability, understood as peace between states, and its means is this whole developing complex of peacekeepers, international agencies, NGOs, and so on. I think the big problem with the liberal peace has been its origins in that the liberal peace is still based on the assumption that war is a contest between two sides. And the centerpiece of the liberal peace is the peace agreement. And the, the peace agreement is treated like old-fashioned peace treaties, where the sides that sign the peace treaty are legitimate organizations. And the problem with that is that actually where you're dealing with a new wars culture, you actually, all you do is to legitimize the actors of the new wars culture. And you may reduce the level of violence, but you sustain the culture of new wars, the predatory extremist uh, social condition. Um, 
and I call this I call this situation hybrid peace. In other words, it's a lot better than war. It is a sort of peace, but it's an uneasy, dysfunctional peace. And I think Bosnia probably represents the best example of that. In fact, Bosnia is the poster child for the liberal peace. Everyone celebrates the Dayton Agreement, which actually legitimized the ethnic warlords in Bosnia. And, you know, we've spent so much money in Bosnia, more money per head than the martial aid. We've deployed large numbers of troops. And despite all that, Bosnia is a hugely dysfunctional society. Uh, which could return to war at any time with high levels of unemployment. Um, and that's the best. Bosnia is the best. The worst, of course, is Syria, where a peace agreement is just not possible. <laughs> and actually, you end up, well, I'm going to say something in that in a minute, you end up with something very similar to Bosnia. It looks like Assad is technically winning. The regime theoretically controls more of the country now than anybody else, but actually it's presiding over a new war's culture. It's a very different society than it was before the war. So it'll end up looking a lot like Bosnia, I think. Maybe worse. Um, and then the final security culture that I want to mention, although I'm not going to talk about it at length, is the war on terror. Uh, and the war on terror, like new wars, is both inside and outside. I think the war on terror represents an evolution of geopolitics to something new. Uh, and it's something new in technological terms, but also in terms of infrastructure. The difference between the war on terror and geopolitics is that it's a war, uh, it's the war of the manhunt. The threat is not a nation state, the threat is individuals and groups of individuals. And it started out of the geopolitical response that Bush took to 9-11, treating the, uh, what happened on 9-11 as an attack on the United States rather than, say, a crime against humanity, which then led him to t make a military response. But it's developed into a very particular form of long-distance assassination on a huge scale, um, which is... Uh, which, uh, which is linked to an infrastructure that's very different from a classic military infrastructure. It involves intelligence agencies on a massive scale because of the use of algorithms to identify the people. It involves special forces. It involves drones, of course. Um, so it's very different. And in power terms, I think you could say, was originally linked to American exceptionalism. <laughs> uh, but increasingly now, of course, it's being spread by other countries. So I, I just wanted to make a pointer to that, that in a sense, the new wars and the war on terror are the most, the sort of new types of security cultures that are around at the moment. So now let me finally turn to the European Union. <laughs> and how do we describe the EU's security culture? And how will it shape and be shaped by the nature of the EU as an institution? Now, as we often say, the European Union is actually neither an intergovernmental organization nor a state, although it's a bit of both. <laughs> it's based both on treaties and elements of constitutionalism. Uh, what I would like to say, to argue, is that I think the EU could involve, evolve into a new type of political institution that I would call a model of global governance. Um, it, I'm not saying it will, I'm just saying it could. <laughs> and what do I mean by a model of global governance? Well, I mean a sort of institution that is not a state, but it restrains the worst aspects of statehood, namely war and repression. <laughs> and it's an institution that, as it were, civilizes or tames globalization. <laughs> it restrains or taxes or regulates global bads, like climate change, financial speculation, extreme inequalities, and so on. 
and it promotes global goods like peace, renewable energies, um, ending extreme poverty, and so on. Um, and evidently, whatever security policy that the EU adopts is absolutely critical in whether it can be such an institution, not only because security is at the heart of power relations, and we trust our institutions if they, we think they keep us safe, but also because the conflicts that are going on that I, in Syria, in Libya, in our neighborhood, and even are, if you like, the sharp end of the bads of globalization, and if we can't deal with them, then there's a very grim prognosis. So, as you all know, um, CSDP dates back to 1999 in Saint-Malo when Tony Blair agreed with Jacques Chirac that Europe needed a security policy. Up to that time, Britain had been a big obstacle to any joint security policy. And as you all also know, Javier Solano was appointed the first high representative for common foreign and security policy and had to develop a security strategy. And as Verna told you, um, I became the convener of a study group that was initially called the study group uh, to, uh, f I can't remember what we called it, something about European security capabilities. That was our, that was the terms of the study group and the members of the study group were chosen jointly by myself and Dr. Solana. And as Van already told you, our first report was published in 2004, and it was called A Human Security Doctrine for Europe. And actually, we, we worked out what the doctrine should be, and then we said we had to give it a name. And we had a lot of discussion among us all, and we decided to give it the name Human Security. Then, of course, we thought we'd better read all the literature on human security, and we went back and discovered its origins in the 1994 UNDP Development Report, and the whole debates that were going on between the Canadian version and the UNDP version. And what we realized was that our version was distinct from all of those. So I want to explain what, what was distinctive about our version and why did we think it was so appropriate for the European Union. Um, basically, when human security is defined, it's usually defined as actually you defined it, People say it's the security of the individual and the communities in which he and she live rather than the security of the state or the security of borders. That's the first element. The second element is that it's not only security from fear, it's security from want. And certainly the original UNDP thinkers we're trying to make the argument that after the end of the Cold War, more and more resources should be devoted to development because it was the lack of development that provoked wars, and that's why development should be seen almost as a security issue. Actually, our definition was something a little bit different, although in fact it encompasses both those. Human security is what we enjoy in a rights-based law-governed society like Austria or Britain. When something terrible happens, a terrorist attack, a fire, um, I don't know, a disaster of some kind, we expect there to be secure, uh, emergency services, firefighters, police, um, medical staff to come to our help. And what we meant by human security was essentially that Europe will be secure if this kind of rights-based law-governed society is extended globally. That was our understanding of human security. And um, I think that, in fact, even though it was only with the global strategy, as Werner pointed out, that the actual term human security was adopted, if you look at the actual missions of the European Union, 
a lot of that was in it, and, and that's what made it a little bit different from classic liberal peace. It was definitely part of the liberal peace, but it was a little bit different. There was a big emphasis on law and policing in all of the EU missions. And, you know, if you look at one or two of the successful missions, there haven't been that many, but nevertheless, it's kind of interesting. I mean, one was Operation Artemis in 2003 in Eastern Congo, where the Europeans sent a force which actually stopped a massacre from happening. Another, I think, has been the anti, which isn't talked up a lot, has been the anti-piracy mission in the Gulf which really has dramatically reduced the level of piracy and has been a human security mission in the sense that it's involved policing rather than war fighting and that it's involved all kinds of development projects like fishing licenses for Somali fishermen. Um, so, um, so I think, of course, that you know, there are huge limitations on EU missions, and I could talk about that at great length, <laughs> but I'm not going to. But they both, both because of the inadequacy of EU capabilities and because of political will. I mean, most of the missions that I've looked at have been become hugely problematic as a result of lack of political will, that at the political level, uh, the EU is torn between being a junior partner to the United States, being pursuing nationalist interests, or pursuing human security. But human security isn't understood as a political objective, except, it, except in a very few instances, which I've just mentioned. So three years ago, we reconvened the study group um, at that time, Javier Solana himself became the co-convener with me of the study group. When he retired, he said, could I join your study group, which was really nice of him. And we reconvened to make a contribution to the global strategy that Werner talked about. And we produced a report which was entitled From Hybrid Peace to second generation human security. And um, actually, it, it's been published now as a book with all the background papers that we commissioned for it. And we presented this to um, the External Action Service and to Mrs. Mogherini. And a great deal of what we put in that report was actually adopted in the global strategy. So I'm not going to talk at length, because I see time marching on, about what was in it. But just very briefly, I mean, hybrid peace I've already explained to you. <laughs> and that has really been largely the consequence of liberal peace missions, including missions from the European Union. Um, so what we meant by second generation human security was trying to think about human security in a practical sense in terms of implementation. And um, I think, again, just to summarize, I mean, what I think we argued was that if you move away from this old-fashioned conception of peace towards a human rights approach, then lots of things become different. Peacemaking, for example, reaching agreements, becomes no longer a sort of top-down effort to bring the armed groups together, but is multi-level and is an attempt to construct legitimate political institutions at local levels as well as at higher levels. And it's an attempt to make sure that the international community attempting this kind of peacemaking recognizes that there are people, groups of people, civil society particularly, who, counter, who try to counter extremist ideologies and predatory behavior that have to be understood as partners in the peacemaking business. Um, in terms of peacekeeping, which is really, if you like, the security element, the emphasis is on very much on the protection of the civilians rather than on fighting an enemy. And that was very much the thrust of what we were saying in the original Barcelona report. And in terms of peace building, there's an emphasis on the need to challenge neoliberal 
uh, policies and create legitimate livelihoods, along with legitimate political authority, absolutely essential is legitimate livelihoods. You can't have a legitimate political authority unless people earn money in a legitimate way and pay taxes. <laughs> and similarly, if people don't have legitimate livelihoods, then they're forced to join militias or to join a criminal gang, and that is just very typical of what happened in Syria. So, a lot of what we said, and there's a lot more than I've just summarized, was adopted in the global strategy. And since then, interestingly, the global strategy has actually made a lot of progress, at least in part because of Brexit, because the British were always emphasizing NATO, the geopolitical security culture, and were very dismissive of the European Union. And so there have been big strides particularly in defense cooperation, in developing implementation of the global strategy. Um, and they haven't only been about defense cooperation. There have been all kinds of projects about medical commands, logistics, disaster relief. So it's a very sort of broad canvas on which all these things are developing. Nevertheless, I think it raises some very important questions about the future because this is only about the development of capabilities. I mean, the first question is, with all this emphasis on defence cooperation, are we moving back towards state-based approaches? Or rather, treating the EU as a state and with all the emphasis on border security and keeping out refugees, this is completely going in an opposite direction from the human rights approach. Or, on the contrary, are these defense capabilities, which I believe are necessary for a genuine human rights-based approach in places like Syria or Libya, a, a, a new kind of peacekeeping that isn't like the old peacekeeping about separating the sides, which they don't mind anyway, but is really about protecting people and respecting human rights. Um, and what kind of mission, and are there, is there going to be a politics that will support these kinds of missions? Um, I'm afraid that if this security policy fails, we will see a continued spread of the new wars culture, precisely because it's a culture, it reproduces itself. And this is what we've seen in all these places. These wars are really difficult to end, and they tend to spread. And we see the sort of spreading culture in Syria, Yemen, throughout the Balkans. And, um, uh, and, you know, I, my fear is it, it affects us as well. It affects us through refugees, it affects us through terrorism, it affects us through uh, organized crime. So if we can't deal with the new wars culture, uh, I, I fear the, we will see the disintegration of the European Union. Um, and I think, but at the same time, no other approach works. Geopolitics doesn't work any longer. Military compellence, as they called it in the old days, doesn't work. The Americans have the most sophisticated, spend the most money on military than any other power on earth, and yet they couldn't maintain, uh, they couldn't bring order and stability to Iraq and Afghanistan. Huge amounts of effort have been spent in bombing ISIS to disintegrating, to dis uh, and uh, with killing of thousands of civilians. And even though ISIS territory has been regained, ISIS is reappearing in the liberated areas. So, and, and again, there's the example of Assad, which I mentioned. You know, to be sure that Russian support for Assad has enabled them to get rid of the opposition in, in large parts of Syria. Yet nevertheless, what they inherit is a country riddled with local militias, all of them engaged in predatory practices, uh, and in which people no longer fear to say what they want, and in which all kinds of repressive things go on. So it seems to me that 
This is actually the human security approach as I've tried to describe it and it's complex and difficult, is in fact the only practicable approach. That doesn't mean we're going to do it, but it is the only way we can address this situation. So let me conclude, because I can see Werner looking at me. What I tr have tried to do is to introduce this idea that there are different ways of doing security, which often isn't apparent to people. So how NATO does security in a geopolitical way is extremely different from how the EU does security. And that's what's not properly understood. When people say we want a security policy, they often think they just want EU to replace NATO. But actually, we want a security policy that is a different, on a different model. Um, So it's not only geopolitical approaches that don't work, but the classic liberal peace approaches don't work either. <laughs> uh, the classic liberal peace d doesn't work. Top-down agreements either at best achieve Bosnia and at worst what we're seeing in Syria. Um, so I think what we're trying to see is if we could only develop an effective human security policy, this would be a big step towards a different type of political authority, namely neither an intergovernmental, which is liberal peace, nor a nation state, which is geopolitics, nor a super state, which might be the war on terror, <laughs> um, but something else which I would call a model of global governance. And that seems to me what we need, not just for us in Europe, uh, but just, uh, but as a sort of crucial tool in addressing global challenges.